Matthew Arnold Matthew Arnold, a prominent figure in the Victorian era, was born on December 24, 1822 in Laleham, Middlesex, England. He was not only a distinguished poet but also a renowned critic and educator. Arnold's early education was at Rugby School, where his father, Thomas Arnold, was a renowned headmaster known for his educational innovations. Matthew Arnold later attended Balliol College, Oxford. In 1844, Arnold began his career as a teacher of classics at rugby school where he had once been a student. He demonstrated his poetic talent through works like Empedocles on Etna and poems, and these early poems established his reputation as a poet. In 1851, Arnold married and he subsequently worked as a government school inspector, a demanding position that involved traveling extensively throughout England and the continent. This role provided him with valuable insights into the state of education which greatly influenced his later critical writings and poetry from 1857 to 1867 arnold served as the professor of poetry at oxford where he delivered lectures in english a departure from the traditional use of latin during this period he produced many of his most celebrated critical works including essays in criticism and culture and anarchy these writings delved into topics related to literature culture and education reflecting the prevailing values of the victorian era Matthew Arnold's poetry is characterized by its meditative and rhetorical style, often addressing themes of psychological isolation. Dove of Beach is one of his most famous poems and explores themes of faith and doubt in the face of an evolving world. His poetry frequently grapples with the challenges of his time, and despite his own religious uncertainties, he sought to emphasize the enduring truth of Christianity in his essays. Arnold's influence extended to both his critical works and his poetry. He argued for a revitalized religious faith and the adoption of classical aesthetics and morals. His writings played a significant role in shaping Victorian intellectual discourse. Furthermore, his transparent and introspective style in his poetry has left a lasting impact on subsequent generations of poets, including W.B. Yeats, Sylvia Plath, and others. In his later years, Arnold made two lecture tours in the United States, solidifying his international reputation. He passed away on April 15, 1888 in Liverpool, leaving behind a substantial body of work and a lasting impact on English literature. Some of his notable works include Culture and Anarchy, Dower Beach, Essays in Criticism, Empedocles on Etna, God and the Bible, On Translating Homer, On the Study of Celtic Culture, Sohrab and Rustam, The Forsaken Merman, The Scholar Gypsy, The Study of Poetry, and Thursis. Study of Poetry Perhaps Arnold's most well-known work of literary criticism can be considered his essay The Study of Poetry. Through this essay Arnold explores poetry's high destiny. He acknowledges that mankind will discover that we have to turn to poetry to interpret life for us, to console us, to sustain us as science and philosophy will ultimately prove to be flimsy and unstable. The purpose of Arnold's essay is to establish a high standard and strict judgment to avoid the mistake of overvaluing certain poems. It applies a method for distinguishing only the best and therefore classic poets. Milton, Shakespeare, Dante and Homer are among Arnold's classic poets and the passages he prevents from each are planned to demonstrate how their poetry is timeless and moving. In Arnold's view, sincerity and feeling are paramount as is the seriousness of the subject. The superior character of truth and seriousness in the matter and substance of the best poetry is inseparable from the superiority of diction and movement marking its style and manner. In Arnold's view, Geoffrey Chaucer is an indispensable poet who does not fall under the classic designation because Chaucer lacks the high seriousness of classic poetry. Arnold's argument is rooted in his desire to enlighten and preserve the poets he believes to be the touchstones of literature and questions about the ethical value of poetry that does not champion truth, beauty, courage and clarity. According to Arnold, poetry should uplift and console. The essay was initially published as the introduction to T H Ward's anthology The English Poets. It was later published in Essays and Criticism second series. Matthew Arnold wrote a critical essay entitled A Study of Poetry. Arnold criticizes both the art of criticism and poetry in this essay. He believes poetry can achieve high destinies. He believes poetry is the art in which the idea is the reality. According to him poetry is a mirror that shows us what life is like. so we should understand its value and according to him science would be incomplete without poetry and philosophy and religion would yield poetry arnold considers poetry as a criticism of life rebutting plato's charge and asserts that man will continue to find comfort and solace in poetry as time goes on 
When we read poetry, Arnold says we tend to judge whether it is of good form or not. There are three types of estimation, the real estimate, the historical estimate and the personal estimate. The real estimate considers both the historical context and the creative faculty of judging poetry's merit. However, the historical and personal estimates often surpass the real estimates. Historical estimates place the context above the art itself. On the other hand, the personal estimate depends on the reader's taste, likes and dislikes, which affects his judgment of poetry. According to Arnold, both of these estimates are fallacious. Historical and personal estimates often overshadow real estimates. Arnold also notes that this phenomenon is natural. In analyzing the historical background of poetry and its development, critics frequently overlook its flaws due to its historical significance. A historical estimate elevates poetry to a high pedestal, preventing one from noticing its faults. Historical estimation creates classics and elevates the poets to nearly godlike status. According to Arnold, if a poet is truly a classic, his work will provide the reader with a pleasant experience and allow them to compare and contrast it with other pieces of poetry that don't meet his standards. According to Arnold, this is the real estimate of poetry. Arnold encourages his readers to read classics with an open mind and not be blind to their flaws. This will enable one to value poetry appropriately. Arnold discusses the idea of imitation in this work. According to him, whatever one reads or knows keeps coming back to him. Thus, if a poet aspires to the highest standards of classicals, he may unconsciously or consciously imitate them. The same is true for critics who rely on historical and personal estimates instead of urban unbiased ones. The study of ancient poets is affected by the historical estimate whereas the, whereas the study of contemporary poets is affected by the personal estimate. To determine whether poetry is of a high standard, Arnold introduces the touchstone analysis method. This method is borrowed from Longinus, who said that if an example of sublimity can be pleasing to anyone regardless of habits, tastes or age, and can be pleasant at any time, this is an example of the sublime. As Addison suggested in England, a man should read classical works that have stood the test of time and place, as well as contemporary pieces that are highly regarded. The man would conclude that it, could, it cannot be the author's fault but the reader's inability to discover them if he fails to find any pleasure in them. In the touchstone method, Arnold compares classic examples with other poems to determine whether they meet the high standard of the classics. According to him, the poems need not be similar to the touchstones. If the critic has formulated touchstones in his mind to detect high po poetic quality, he will be able to find it in other poetry by comparing it to the touchstones. In an attempt to illustrate touchstone poetry, Arnold quotes Homer, Dante, Shakespeare and Milton. Although the examples he mentions are very different, they all have a high po poetic quality. A critic does not need to struggle in vain to explain the importance of poetry. A few examples of poetry of the highest quality and manner. He then follows Aristotle's observation and says that the best form of poetry comprises truthfulness and seriousness that make up its subject matter and superior diction that marks its manner. Nevertheless, Arnold points out that the real strength of this method lies in its application. As a result, he encourages critics to evaluate poetry using the touchstone method. The Scholar Gypsy and Thursis The Scholar Gypsy is a lyric poem by Matthew Arnold, initially published in his collection of poems titled Poems in 1853. This poem, written in ten-line stanzas, is a splendid example of Arnold's poetic artistry. It explores the tale of a legendary Oxford scholar who abandons his academic life to join a band of gypsies. He travels with them, absorbing their customs and searching for the source of their wisdom. Arnold's poem is replete with vivid descriptions of the picturesque countryside surrounding Oxford. The historical background for the scholar Gypsy is derived from an excerpt by Glanville, which recounts the story of a destitute Oxford student. This student forsakes his academic pursuits to accompany a group of gypsies. During his time with them, he becomes closely acquainted with their secrets and knowledge. When former Oxford associates encounter him, they learn from him that the gypsies possess a traditional kind of learning and can perform remarkable feats using the power of imagination. The scholar gypsy promised to share these secrets with the world after learning everything the gypsies could teach him. Arnold's poem begins with a pastoral tone, invoking a shepherd and vividly describing the idyllic countryside, with Oxford visible in the distance. He then recounts the essence of the scholar gypsy's story but extends it with rumours suggesting sightings of him around Oxford in more recent times. Arnold imagines this scholar gypsy as a shadowy figure who can still be glimpsed in the Berkshire and Oxfordshire landscapes, waiting for divine inspiration to strike. 
Arnold even claims to have seen him once himself. He briefly entertains doubts about the scholar gypsy's continued existence after two centuries but quickly dismisses them. The scholar gypsy cannot have died. Arnold implores the scholar gypsy to stay away from all those who are afflicted by the philistinism of modern life, lest he too be tainted by it and meet a similar fate. The poem concludes with an extended simile involving a Tyrian merchant seaman who seeks new horizons in Iberia, fleeing from the competition of Greek rivals. Thyrsis is another of Arnold's significant works, published in 1866 and later included in new poems in 1867. In this elegiac poem, Arnold pays tribute to his friend, the poet Arthur Hugh Clow, who had passed away in 1861. Arnold portrays Clow as Thyrsis, a shepherd poet, a traditional Greek name. Using rich pastoral imagery, the poem reflects on their student days in Oxford during the 1840s and explores the fate of their youthful ideals after leaving the university. Thyrsis is considered one of Arnold's finest poems and showcases his command of an intricate ten-line stanza form. Dower Beach Dower Beach, a lyric poem by English poet Matthew Arnold, was likely composed around 1849, but first published in 1867 within the collection New Poems. It is believed to have been written in 1851 during Arnold's honeymoon at the Strait of Dower, the narrowest part of the English Channel, where the poem is primarily set. In its opening lines, Arnold vividly describes the location and the surrounding scene, emphasizing the grating roar of the sea as it washes over the stony English shoreline. This setting was inspired by his experiences during his honeymoon facing the English port of Dover in Kent and the French port of Calais in France. The poem's composition can be traced to a draft of the first 28 lines, which were recorded on the back of notes about the career of Empedocles, dating back to the 1849s or 1850s. The thematic connection between Dover Beach and Empedocles in Etna, written between 1849 and 52, suggests a common thread in Arnold's contemplations during that period. Analyzing Dower Beach is a nuanced task, as its iconic passages and metaphors have become so ingrained in literary consciousness that they often elude fresh interpretation. The poem begins with Arnold depicting a night scene at Dower in meticulous detail, invoking a sensory experience marked by the grating roar of the sea. Some readers have suggested that the speaker may be addressing his wife, drawing from the context of Arnold's honeymoon, while others view it as an expression of the poet's discontent with contemporary society. Nevertheless, the poem reveals that through love, the speaker finds a glimmer of hope amidst a society he perceives as less alluring than in the past. Arnold's exploration of the scene soundscape in the first and second stanzas, followed by an examination of the retreating tide in the third, allows readers to share in his perception of the sea's everlasting note of sadness. Here the poem references Sophocles, the ancient Greek playwright, who similarly heard this note as he stood on the shores of the Aegean Sea. The interpretation of this allusion varies among critics, with Arnold perceiving it as the ebbing of faith in a rapidly industrializing 19th century society, while Sophocles' interpretation leans towards humanism. These differences reflect the artistic aspirations of both figures. Arnold as a lyric poet and Sophocles as a tragedian, each striving to elevate this note of sadness into a higher order of experience. Arnold's focus then shifts to the actions of the retreating wave, using auditory imagery to convey the metaphor of dwindling faith in the modern world. The auditory motif is reinforced with phrases like its melancholy long withdrawing roar. The fourth stanza introduces a contrasting image of joyous fullness akin to the opening scene. The poem culminates with a call for love and concludes with a famous metaphor. Interpreting the initial two lines of the final stanza has prompted diverse viewpoints, ranging from them being seen as a superficial gesture overwhelmed by the poet's dark imagery to viewing them as a stand against a world afflicted by eroding faith. The poem's closing metaphor likely alludes to a passage in Thucydides' account of the Peloponnesian War. This reference describes an ancient battle on a similar beach during Athenian invasion of Sicily. In the darkness, the attacking soldiers became disoriented and unintentionally inflicted harm upon one another. Various interpretations of this final image exist. Some regard Arnold's darkling plane as a central statement of the human condition, while others see the last line as a met merely metaphorical and subject to the inherent ambiguity of poetic language. 
The poem's unity has been a subject of debate as the seed described in the opening stanza does not appear in the final stanza and the darkling plain is not explicitly described at the beginning. Critics have proposed various solutions to this issue. It's been suggested that the poem's ending refers to the darkling plain of the world while another perspective appreciates the poem for its emotional resonance despite logical inconsistencies. In summary, Dower Beach is a multifaceted poem that presents intricate shifts in discourse, metaphors, and imagery as it explores themes of love, faith, and the human condition. Its rich use of sensory and auditory elements, combined with its complex structure, has solidified its place as a thought-provoking and emotionally resonant work in the realm of English poetry.